And ironically, what we say online may actually be private. So it sounds like we have the technology to have end-to-end -end data encryption and risk mitigation would say that companies should dump the data and encrypt it as well. But since this interrupts their revenue through like data sales, how do consumers take control of their data and privacy when opting out of these apps really isn't an option? Or, you know, I no longer have a Facebook, but I still have an Instagram. They're owned by the same company, so I'm not really... Um, I, I'm just stopping giving them additional data, but um, at least on the Facebook platform. But how do we take more control over this when the tools are there, but they're not being utilized? Right. That's a very good question. And, um, you know, people think they're doing something when they're moving from one platform to another. Like uh, here, just a few months ago, a lot of people moved from WhatsApp because of their policy, which uh, people... I think read correctly that they're going to uh, use your data in ways that you might not want. Um, and eventually they move to do something like this. So they move to Telegram, which I would say is a strong, uh, you know, and Signal, um, which is run by two anarchists, uh, essentially anarchist minded people, libertarian minded people uh, who want to secure your conversations and make them private. Um, I'm going to say there's two things. One is, um, there are real societal trade-offs between end-to-end -end encryption and privacy on the one hand and safety and accountability on the other hand. Um, you know, you, if everyone is always having private conversations, uh, all you have is metadata, you know, who is talking to whom and so forth, how frequently. Um, and sometimes you don't even have that because the metadata may itself be obfuscated through, you know, um, networks that, are not well, the encryption hard. layers, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so what you're ha what you're basically dealing with is a lot of the people in the FBI and National Security Agency and others tasked with trying to keep people safe. Uh, they want as much uh, firepower as they can, as many tools as they can, and of course they would want as much as possible, which is to say, read everybody's information all times. And in fact, Snowden revealed that they were doing exactly this. Uh, with a big fat pipe uh, coming out of these uh, corporations because um, you only have that big database and you have to get in there. Sometimes they give what's called a national security letter, an NSL letter, uh, which uh, comes with a gag order and you can't tell anyone that you got the letter, but you actually get, uh, you have to hand over all this information. So they either do it by hacking you as they did with PRISM, uh, you know, uh, whatever, which Snowden showed, or they, uh, they do it through just calling up these corporations and saying, look, we, have, we know you have the data, uh, please give it to us and we will try to find any threats. Now, look, um, it's very easy. It's going to be very easy to have pervasive AI. I mean, literally just the other day of uh, satellites uh, can see you everywhere. I don't know, there's a story basically of satellites um, now can watch you everywhere all the time. Um, and of course, you don't need satellites. You have cameras all over the place, small cameras. If those databases are all linked, you can have an AI pretty much figure out where you've been. It can also figure out emerging patterns of a movement and people visiting each other and planning something. Uh, I can figure out things, but of course, you know, on the one hand, you have dissidents who are peaceful. On the other hand, you may have terrorists who are planning a terror attack. And so it's very hard to say what a society would have if you went back to um, um, just end-to-end -end encryption, because then it would be, they would need a mole in every organization. Um, and it, that's how people used to operate in the past. You know, Here in the United States, you have the McCarthy era, where they were bugging the, uh, the communists or the socialists. In the USSR, they had the KGB, where they were bugging uh, people who were against uh, their uh, whatever their government uh, was, you know, religion, religions or whatever. So governments uh, tend to place uh, law enforcement agencies like Hoover's FBI would place, you know, listening devices and moles, etc. Today, they don't need to do that because they can just read your data. Um, but 
you, uh, we've, we've said that you cannot spy on your own citizens. You know, one of the things about the spy agencies is that they should be spying on others. One last thing I want to say about that is the five eyes, however, is an arrangement of friendly countries, alliance between the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and of course, their spy agencies can spy on our citizens and our spy agencies can spy on their citizens. So by linking those databases together, you can circumvent pretty much any um, restriction on spying on your own citizens. You just ask the other country to give you whatever information you, you need. Um, so, so much for the national security apparatus. Your question was more about the, the commercial, right? Uh, applications of it. And funny enough, the advertisers are in a way, um, they're also interested in the same things. So um, back, you know, years ago, I wrote this, um, the genie's out of the bottle. Um, welcome to the big data revolution. And what it talked about is that essentially the big data is all about putting all the data in one place. And the idea, I wrote this like literally seven years ago, is that it's not just the NSA that wants your data, it's everybody. And fighting this is a losing battle. So it's interesting because big data is like crack cocaine to these organizations. And, you know, and it's worse than crack cocaine because with crack, there's no competition competing to get more crack. But with big data, if you don't have the big data, right, then you're at a disadvantage to the other ones that do have the big data. So you almost like cannot not have a, a service that like puts, you know, these unfair advantages in there or so they think. Um, and I'll get to really quickly the uh, different other business models where you don't need to vacuum up people's data. They've just been kind of lazy and externalizing the cost to society by doing this because it's like easy. Hey, why not take everyone's data if you can get away with it? which Facebook does all the time. They take it, they get caught, they apologize. They say they won't do it again. And sometimes they do exactly, they continue to do that thing. Uh, sometimes they do other things. Google uh, has now put out this thing called Flock, which is uh, essentially a way to say, okay, Apple's third-party cookies. Uh, we, we are not gonna do third-party cookies. We're gonna ban third-party cookies with Chrome as well. But we're going to basically do statistical analysis on certain other things and put you in cohorts of what you're likely to buy and things like that. So essentially, that's what Google is doing. Why are they all doing it? Google said they're not going to be evil. So is this evil? So Eric Schmidt said, we're going to go right up to the line, but not cross it. Who decides where the line is? So essentially, I make this joke that you know how you call people users, right? The users. Uh, so... Drug, drug users also, customers of drugs are called users. Uh, these corporations- there are, few, there are a few people, uh, yeah, I've read that part of your paper somewhere, article somewhere, where there are very few actually customers that are called users, right? <laughs> if you think about it. it exactly. Yeah. I mean, in this case, I would say the corporation is the user and the data is the crack, right? So you, you really want you can't get off of it, the data crack pipe. Um, but here are some ways you can get off. First, the large government, um, you know, the uh, European Union and uh, other governments might put the ban hammer down, make it costly for you to store data. So now you need compliance. Or now you need, uh, you might be hit with a very costly uh, thing that might kill your company, right? That's one. Um, I'm a more libertarian minded person, if you've seen any of my videos. So I believe that we should have end to end encryption through open source software. I believe that if there's anything we want to accomplish uh, as an alternative to big tech, we need to step up as society and put up some money, time and collaborate and create open source software like we've done with Linux, you know, web browsers, web servers, uh, you know, WordPress and, and tons of other things. Um, we need to create open source software that's going to be as good as the proprietary software. And then there is no profit motive and people are going to move to it eventually. Same way they move to WordPress. Some people are going to stay on the, on the proprietary software, but at least they have a choice. The other answer is that there are so many business models that you don't need people's data for. You just need their intentions. For example, when you go to Google, you're searching for something and that's an intent. Uh, you have, let's say I search for, uh, uh, I don't know, flying drones, right? 
I might want to buy a drone. So thank you, Google, for not putting an ad over here. But uh, I'm actually surprised. Usually they would put ads. But this is surprisingly free of ads. I was going to say that this is a great time to, to let me know that you could buy a drone, right? How about if I do buying a drone? I'm sure they're going to give me some ads, right? Yep, there you go. Ads, buying a drone. So each of these represents a user intent. I don't need to know the person's interest. They just told me what they want to do. So that's one thing. And that's what, um, for example, um, Duck, Duck Go talks about. It says, we don't store your data. But of course, uh, buying a drone, I'm pretty sure they're going to show me some ads. Well, they do. maybe not yet, but eventually I'm sure they will <laughs> in the future. Oh, here we go. Ads. Yeah. So anyway, my point is one is just intent. You don't need to get people's information. Just capture their intent by having a search engine for things. At Cubix, the very first thing we did before building all of this is we wanted to build a search engine for your social life. And we wanted to say, what are my friends doing? Uh, I want to go out and do something. So we may capture people's interests, but we don't capture their name. So at least it's like all these random nameless IDs have these interests. They've been to these places, right? But at least we don't have their names. Um, group discounts is a big one. So when you're trying to do something, there's an intent. It's hard to organize an activity. If a site can help you to organize a group activity, then that activity takes place. The merchant can then give a group discount to everybody and they can give you a cut for helping bring more people to, to the site. Facebook is not thinking along these lines. And, and you know, micro payments is another thing where you pay a site with cryptocurrency. It doesn't have to know who you are. It just needs to collect information for serving you content and something like that. We're also exploring. Uh, we have the Cubix, uh, you know, ecosystem for digitizing uh, the economics of digitizing media and content. So instead of having these paywalls, you can just come and you can have a micro payment happen from Facebook to New York Times or whatever. Um, and I talked about this last time when I talked about the news media and how they are in a war with Facebook and Australia. So those are some ideas. There's tons of ideas. There's tons of business models, software as a service, um, e-commerce. You don't need people's information. And with crypto, you might in the f have a future where people won't give you their information. They'll just send you the cryptocurrency. You don't know who they are. But then again, the, the, it goes back to the national security question. What if somebody is buying materials to make a bomb? How do you know? So you're going to have the spy agencies be very strong uh, voices in, you know, like the FBI and uh, William Barr and others uh, talking about how we do need a backdoor and we do need keys to everything. So you're going to see that. Yeah, there was a there was a famous uh, famous uh, appeal to the Supreme Court, I think, uh, from the Justice Department against Apple after the security uh, incident on the phone when they wanted to open the phone of the terrorist in California. Right. That's right. That's right. The mm -hmm. William uh, Barr D Department of Justice. Uh, I don't think it was Barr's Department of Justice. It was before Barr. It may have been before, yeah. but I, I yeah. Ah, but he announced the, the, the prosecution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter who it was. Every Department of Justice administration under any party is going to be interested in, in the most tools. Although I would be surprised if they ever put someone, uh, you know, who is a civil libertarian to such an extent that even though they're in that position, they're gonna not sacrifice civil liberties for national security. 